G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Revelation. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you as you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you. So tonight we're looking at, uh, from chapter 16, verse 12, to chapter 17, verse 18, Book of Revelation. Last session, which was two weeks or so ago, we were introduced to another beast coming up out of the earth, and that was the false prophet, the counterfeit Holy Spirit. Remember, we look at these uh, at, at this situation, we have a counterfeit system here. We have the, the counterfeit father in Satan. We have the counterfeit son in the Antichrist. We have the counterfeit Holy Spirit in the false prophet. So we last session, we were introduced to this other beast, and he's the false prophet. He comes up out of the earth. He had an image made of the Antichrist and life is given to that image and he calls all men to worship the Antichrist. And those who now own the Antichrist as God, they take a mark on their forehead or on their right arm. And this is the counterfeit seal, just as you and I have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. These guys who own Antichrist as God take the counterfeit seal. Now, once they take that seal, it's a point of no return. There's no opportunity for them to be saved after having taken the mark and owning the Antichrist as God. They're now destined for the bold judgments and the lake of fire. The mark of the beast we learned last time is, is the number of, a, of the man's name and his number is equivalent to 666. And that comes out of whatever his Hebrew name is. It, it, the numerical value of his Hebrew name is 666. We also saw last time that there were seven mid-tribulation announcements because we're in the mid-tribulation. We started last week. We're in the mid-tribulation. And those mid-tribulation announcements were predicting the failure of the counterfeit trinity. The program of the counterfeit trinity, it was predicted to fail. And it was also the announcement of the bold judgments. And these are the last, uh, the bold judgments are the last seven judgments, which brings the tribulation to an end. It was also to give encouragement to the saints in the second half of the tribulation. Now, the second half of the tribulation, so far we've had five bold judgments poured out. Um, We've had, uh, first of all, the first bold judgment, those who had taken the mark of the beast now have grievous sores upon themselves. The second bowl judgment, we had the rest of the salt water turned to blood. And the third bowl judgment with the rest of the fresh water was now turned to blood. Uh, also, what else would he have? We had the temper- temperature of the sun was increased and it was scorching men. They couldn't get away from it. And then we had number four blackout where the entire world was in darkness. And all the while these things are going on, these guys are blaspheming God. It it didn't occur to them uh, to turn to God. Okay, so this week now we're into chapter 16, verse 12. And this is now the sixth bold judgment. And uh, this sixth bold judgment also initiates the campaign of Armageddon. And the seventh bowl will end it. Here we go in verse 12. And the sixth bowl, the sixth poured out his bowl upon the great river, the river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way might be made ready for the kings that come from the sun rising. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits, as it were frogs. For they are spirits of demons, working signs, which go forth unto the kings of the whole world to gather them together unto the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is the he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together into the place which is called in Hebrew, Harmageddon. Okay, so with the outpouring of the sixth bold judgments, remember we've, we've seen five so far. This is number six. We've got one more to go after this. With the outpouring of this sixth bold judgment, the Euphrates River will be dried up. 
And this famous river is a major river in Mesopotamia, which is present day Iraq. I can hear somebody talking there. Okay, this drying up process, um, oh, sorry, uh, this famous river is present day Iraq. It was mentioned earlier back in Revelation when the sixth trumpet sounded, that was Revelation 9. And the angels were loosed who were bound there. Remember, uh, there were angels who were bound at that river Euphrates, waiting for this time. And this drying up process will be for the purpose of making it easier for the Antichrist to assemble his forces for the Armageddon campaign. Although it's become common to identify the kings that come from the sun rising, you know, people say, oh, come from the sun rising, come from the, or the kings of the east. Well, what they say is, well, they're obviously the Chinese. Well, no, 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 no. And what they try and do is they try and combine these, this, these guys here with the army of the 200 million of Revelation 9. And we need to be consistent in the way we interpret scripture. Uh, neither, neither the proper interpretation nor the structure of the book of Revelation allow these to mix. They're two different things. The 200 million that we, we saw and the kings of the east belong to two different judgment periods. And they, they, they're distinct. We can't, we can't sort of join them together just because we want to. The 200 million were back in the trumpet judgment, if you remember, whereas the kings of the east are in a bold judgment. So the trumpet judgments were finished with them. We're now into the bold judgments. Back in Revelation 9, back in Revelation 9, we... Um, Back there, somebody's still not muted. Uh, Val's phone's not muted. Okay. Back when we saw back in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 9, it was shown that the 200 million are demons. They're not men, uh, especially not Chinese men or any other men. So the structure of the book doesn't allow us to, to make these two judgments into one judgment. Also, it rules out the kings of the east as a reference to the Chinese. Why? Because everywhere else in the scriptures, the east always refers to Mesopotamia, which is Assyria or Babylonia. So we need to be consistent um, when we interpret the scriptures. Okay. In, in actual fact, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it speaks about the wise men coming from the east. The east wasn't China. The east was Babylonia. Okay. And the fact that the Antichrist capital city of Babylon will sit on the banks of the Euphrates River further attests to the fact that the kings who come from the east will be Mesopotamian kings. So consistency of scripture, consistency of interpretation militates against matching this reference with China. It has nothing to do with China at all. Okay, we need to interpret the scripture first. And then we look at current events. We don't look at current events and then try and fit current events into the, into the scripture. Wrong way of doing it. Sixth bowl judgment will dry up the Euphrates to make it easy for the Antichrist Babylonian forces to maneuver. And this is an actual drying up of the river that forms the eastern border of Israel, which we see from Genesis 15 verse 8. And this is, uh, and, and from the capital city of Babylon, a decree or a call is issued from the king of the world. This is the Antichrist at this time. Remember, that he's, now the, he's now the king of the world. And, so he, and, and, and Babylon is his capital city. And so he issues a decree to his allied forces, which are the other seven kings still living. And they're supposed to gather their armies together and meet him in a specific place, which we're going to see shortly. And the gathering of this final campaign against the Jews is clearly the work of the counterfeit trinity. From a human viewpoint, it would appear that the armies of the nations are gathering on their own. But in actual fact, John makes it clear that the military movement is according to God's plan. All three members of the counterfeit trinity are involved in this, in this uh, gathering here. We see the dragon or Satan, 
uh, who is the counterfeit father. We see the beast or the antichrist, the counterfeit son, and the false prophet, the counterfeit Holy Spirit. And they're going to influence the nations and cause the rulers to assemble their armies together. And these, the, these three demonic messengers which they send out, these unclean spirits, will be empowered to perform signs in order to assure the compliance of these other kings. And uh, any reluctance on their part, they'll be soon turned to, turn to the way of the demons because of the things that the demons can do, the signs that they can do. Okay, so these kings we know are the seven kings. These are the seven of the ten. Remember the ten horns? Uh, these are the seven who were left. These have been under the authority of the Antichrist since the midpoint of the tribulation. Remember, we're in the second half of the tribulation now. But all this will simply fulfill the will of God and accomplish his purposes, because we see that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 17. For God did put in their hearts to do his mind and to come to one mind and to give their kingdom unto the beast, unto the words of God should be accomplished. So the Gentile nations will look on Armageddon as a battle, but actually not, but to God it's not a battle. It'll only be a, a supper for the fowls of the river, for the fowls of the air. And we're going to see that in Revelation 19 when we get there. Okay. All right. So now, while the term the battle of Armageddon has been commonly used, it's incorrect. Because, uh, because more than one battle will be taking place. And, and nowadays, many prophetic teachers have stopped employing or stopped calling it the Battle of Armageddon, and they now call it the Campaign of Armageddon. Um, it's actually not actually, that's, that's also wrong because there'll be no fighting in Armageddon. All the fighting is going to take place elsewhere. A more biblical name or biblical name that's given for this uh, final conflict is found in the closing words of verse 14. It is the war of the great day of God the Almighty. And this is a, a more accurate description of the nature and the extent of this final conflict. Remember, this is the third world war of the tribulation itself. And the train of thought is now interrupted. John's train of thought is no longer on this. He's now interrupted by verse 15. What's, what's he saying in verse 15? This is simply a message of comfort and hope to the believers living at this point in the tribulation. And they are encouraged to continue in the faith. For when they see the gathering of the armies together, when they see the gathering for this, this campaign of Armageddon, they know that the second coming is not far away. It's just around the corner. So this is a message of comfort as given at this point to all believers so as to give them hope because they know Messiah is returning very shortly. Christ's return is often compared to the coming of a thief. It doesn't mean he's a thief. It simply means that you don't know when, he's, when a thief's going to come. It just it implies he suddenly comes and we're unprepared for a thief. And so he suddenly comes. And as far as believers are concerned, uh, just as Christians are not to be uh, surprised by the rapture of the church, um, so also believers at the time of the second coming will actually be anticipating his return. And blessing is promised to the one who is prepared for the coming of the Lord by being attired or being dressed, clothed in the righteousness or clothing which God himself supplies. How does one get ready? One needs to place their faith in the Messiah. So the admonition in Revelation 16, verse 15, applies to us all. Behold, I, as Jesus, come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Jesus Christ may return for his bride at any time. That's the rapture, at any time. And it admonishes us to keep our lives clean, to watch and to be faithful. Now, train of thought is picked up again in verse 16, which names the place where the allies of the Antichrist will be gathered. It's a place called Harmageddon, H-A-R-M-A-G-E-D-O-N. And this is what we see in the ASV version of the Bible. In others, you'll see the uh, Armageddon. 
So uh, the word is a combination of two Hebrew words, which means the mountain, which is Har, the mountain of Megiddo. Now, where's Megiddo? Megiddo was a strategic city. It was located at the western end of the Jezreel Valley. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's guarding the famous uh, Megiddo Pass into Israel's largest valley. And one can see the entire valley of Jezreel from the mount upon which the city of Megiddo stood. So you can see, oh, if you're on the mount, you can see the entire valley. So what is known as the Valley of Armageddon in Christian circles is actually the biblical valley of Jezreel. Now, the term Armageddon is never applied to the valley itself, but only to the mount, the western end of the valley. And here, in this large valley of Lower Galilee, the armies of the world will gather for the purpose of destroying all the Jews still living. Remember, this campaign is all about annihilating the Jewish people. Remember why? Because uh, on, unless the Jews call for the return of the Messiah, he will not come. Therefore, Satan and his cohorts are trying to annihilate all the Jews from the earth. So no one calls for him to come back. No one calls for Messiah to come back. Now, something else. I better slow down a bit. Something else here. The passage says nothing of a, of a battle in this valley. For no fighting actually takes place here. The valley of, of Jezreel, guarded by the Mount of Megiddo, will simply serve as the gathering ground for the armies of the Antichrist. Armageddon will play the same role that England played in the closing stages of World War II, because where did the Allied forces gather? They gathered in England in a place called Dover. Um, and, uh, and what happened was, where did the fighting take place? The fighting took place on the beaches of Normandy in France. That was in D-Day. So Armageddon uh, will also serve as a gathering place with the battle beginning elsewhere. I'll give you a quick burst. Uh, next week, I'll put a, um, uh, a, a chart in for you to see the campaign of Armageddon. I'll give you a quick burst. The first stage of the campaign is the gathering at Armageddon, and we see it here in Revelation 16. The second stage of the campaign is the destruction of the city of Babylon, and we see that in Isaiah chapters 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51, and we're going to see it in Revelation chapter 18. We'll see that later. The third stage of the campaign is the attack and the taking of Jerusalem, and we see that in Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14. The fourth stage uh, is the forces of the Antichrist heading down to a place called Bosra or Petra, uh, where the focal point of the Jewish remnant is now hiding. And we see that from Jeremiah 49, 12 to 13. And it, it is at this point, at that point, uh, that we enter the last three days of the tribulation, according to Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. So that's the first four stages. The fifth stage is the national regeneration of Israel. Uh, and there are Lots of scriptures on this point. Uh, the best would be Zechariah uh, 12, 10 to 13, 9. Uh, also Psalm 79 and Psalm 80. These are, these are uh, scriptures about the regeneration of Israel. Three, three of the best ones anyway. The sixth stage of the campaign is the second coming of Christ. And where does he come? He comes to the city of Basra or Petra. Uh, and remember, that's in southern Jordan. And the best passages for those are Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 2 to 3, Isaiah 34, 1 to 7, and Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 6. Uh, and there are other passages as well, but they're the, they're the, they're the easiest to find. We're, we're going to see, so we're going to deal with some specific verses when we get to chapter 19. Then the seventh stage uh, is the battle between Christ and the Antichrist. And this goes all the way back to the Valley of Jehoshaphat outside Jerusalem. And this we, we'll see in, in Joel chapter 3, verse 9 to 14. Uh, the eighth and final stage of the campaign of Armageddon is a victory ascent up the Mount of Olives 
which brings the whole thing to an end. And we see that in Zechariah 14, 1 to 5. That's where, that's where Jesus himself, the victory is sent up the Mount of Olives. So the sixth bowl, which is where we are now, the sixth bowl judgment is the first stage of the campaign of Armageddon. First stage. Okay. All right. So a couple of passages here I put in for you. Uh, Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Uh, and these passages, uh, and also Psalm 20, uh, Psalm, Psalm 2, 1 to 6, not Psalm 21, Psalm 2, 1 to 6. Now, th these passages describe the gathering of the armies of the nations in, in more or less from uh, uh, a man's perspective. From man's standpoint, uh, um, sorry, the, the passage we just looked at. From man's standpoint, it is simply a military gathering called together by the Antichrist. You know, the Antichrist has called us together. We're going we're to get together, ha have a bit of a, a campaign to destroy the Jews. But two, two other passages, which are these two passages here, uh, Joel 3, 9 to 11, uh, and Psalm 2, 1 to 6, gives it to us from God's perspective. Here's Joel. Proclaim ye this among the nations. Prepare a war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Hasty and come, all ye nations round about, and gather yourselves together. Thither cause your mighty ones to come down, O Jehovah. So God's viewpoint here is one of mockery. The nations are mockingly encouraged to go ahead and turn their farming equipment into weapons of war. As for those who are weak, let them persuade themselves and pretend that they're strong. Because while Satan and the Antichrist gather the nations for the purpose of destroying the Jews, God has his own very different purpose for permitting this gathering to take place. And this taunting of the gathering of the nations, we also see in Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Jehovah and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. Then will he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So in Psalm 2, the gathering of the nations is presented as a gathering against God the Father and against his anointed. And his anointed is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And by seeking to destroy the Jews, Satan is also seeking to break the cords of God's control over the world. How foolish a created being trying to do that. Then God is portrayed as sitting in the heavens and laughing because he will soon have these nations in confusion. It is God who will set his own king upon Zion and Satan and the Antichrist will not be able to prevent it. Although the nations will assemble themselves to carry out the program of the counterfeit trinity, they'll actually accomplish the purpose of the triune God. This gathering of the armies of the nations in the valley of Jezreel will be the first stage of the campaign of Armageddon. Revelation 16, 17 and 21 gives us the seventh and final bowl. And the seventh this is the seventh angel. The seventh poured out his bowl upon the air, and they came forth a great voice out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were lightnings and voices and thunders, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since there were men upon the earth. So great an earthquake, so mighty. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And Babylon the great was remembered in the sight of God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail, every stone about the weight of a talent, cometh down out of heaven upon men. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, 
for the plague thereof is exceeding great. Now, the various things mentioned in the seventh bowl are all results that we know from other scriptures, especially from chapter 19 of Revelation and Zechariah chapter 14. These are all the results of the second coming of Christ. So what the seventh bowl tells us is what is going to conclude the Armageddon campaign. And that is the second coming of Christ along with the various manifestations around the second coming of Christ. We're told in verse 17 of chapter 16, with the seventh bowl, the tribulation is finished because the voice comes out and says, it is done. It's finished. This is the end of it. So with the seventh bowl, the tribulation comes to an end. And we have a number of results here. First of all, there's going to be convulsions throughout nature. An earthquake. This is the same earthquake mentioned in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Jerusalem, the great city, which we see from Revelation 11, verse 8, that's what it's called there, will be subdivided with this earthquake into three sections. The cities of the Gentiles are going to collapse. And the city of Babylon, which is the Antichrist capital, is also destroyed. We see that in Revelation 18 when we get there. There are going to be changes in geography because all sorts of things are happening over the world. Islands disappear. Mountains are flattened. And so also, what else do we see? We see hail begins to pour out, killing many, and yet men fail to repent. You know what? These hailstones, it says that they're, they're, they're the, the, the weight of a talent. That's about 50 to 60 kilogram hailstones. That's no mean feat. Now, one of the hail comes anyway. Why? Because you know what, you know what the, uh, the punishment was for blaspheming God? Back in Leviticus 24, 16, it was stoning. So these guys are being stoned with some pretty giant stones. 50 to 60 kilograms of hail. Now, even though these last judgments will bring about cataclysmic destructions on the earth, there will be survivors. And unbelievable as it is, <laughs> they're going to persist in blaspheming God. Rather than turning to him for mercy, everything that humanity has built will fall apart before their eyes. Literally, the whole world will collapse around about them, yet they will still believe that they can control their own fate and will not bow down to God or believe that they have any need for him. And the conclusion of this series of judgments brings us to the second coming of Christ. And this we see in chapter 19 when we get there. But John is first given a vision of the details concerning Babylon, which has been mentioned several times before. And with these bold judgments, the tribulation comes to an end. Okay, now, this is the ecclesiastical Babylon. This is, the, this, again, we're, in the, this is, we're, we're now going back to uh, what we're doing here. The Apostle John, in, in this chapter, chapter 17, he does what many of the prophets actually do. You know, they'll, he now goes back and he now fills in some more detail of what he has summarized previously. And this is called the law of recurrence. Remember, we, we spoke about this in the very first session we did. The law of recurrence tells us that we have one block of scripture giving us the events from start to finish. But that is followed by a second block of scripture, which, which goes back to the first, go back to the beginning, but it gives us more detail. So from chapter 6 of Revelation to chapter 16, we've been given in chronological sequence the events of the Great Tribulation period. And with chapter 16, the tribulation now comes to an end. Chapter 17 to 18 now follow the law of recurrence, going back to certain aspects of the first block of scripture, chapter 6 to 16, and he, he now, John's going to give us some more detail of what's actually happening. Chapter 17 gives us some detail of what is going on during the first half of the tribulation. Chapter 18 gives us some details regarding two earlier statements, and that is the fall of Babylon. Twice, Revelation mentions the fall of Babylon with no detail. Chapter 18, which is uh, next week, following the law of recurrence, will give us some more detail on it. Now, Ecclesiastical Babylon. 
So chapter 17 to 18 both deal with the aspect of Babylon, but chapter 17 deals with religious or ecclesiastical Babylon. And chapter 18 will deal with the political and economic Babylon. Bit of background here on Babylon. Uh, we have lots of information about Babylon as a source of false religion, uh, uh, beginning right back in Genesis 10 and 11 with the building of the Tower of Babel. Uh, Babel means confusion. Uh, and later the name was applied to the city of Babylon itself. And uh, one of its famous rulers is a guy called Hammurabi. And, uh, you know, after a period of decline, you know, Babylon rose up again on the, another one, king called Nebuchadnezzar. And that was 600 years before Christ. Now, some more things about this. Also, uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, Saddam Hussein was the, the, the leader of uh, Iraq. And he portrayed himself as a successor to Nebuchadnezzar. And he was actually rebuilding Babylon. Uh, Babylon's about 50, 50 miles south of Baghdad. Um, it was important, not only politically, but also religiously. Nimrod. He's a guy we see back in Genesis chapter 10. He founded Babylon. He had a wife. This is a, this is a little bit of, of the background of the cult that started out of Babylon. Uh, he had a wife called Semiramis who founded the secret religious rites of the Babylonian mysteries. And according to outside accounts, uh, Semiramis had a son with an alleged miraculous conception who was given the name Tammuz and in effect was a false fulfillment of the promise of the seed of the woman given to Eve in Genesis 3.15. Um, there are lots of religious practices to do, to do with these Babylonian religions, um, including this one, including this one, which was recognition of the mother and child as God and of creating an order of virgins who became religious prostitutes. Now, uh, Tammuz, according to tradition, was killed and then he was restored to life. Uh, and this was a satanic uh, anticipation counterfeit of Christ's resurrection. Uh, scripture continually condemns the, these, these false religions. Uh, Jeremiah and the prophets do this. The worship of Baal is uh, tied to Tammuz. Okay, what else? What else can I tell you about Babylon? Um, a lot of the mystery religions. Um, we see them, uh, many of the mystery religions moved to a place called Pergamum. Uh, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor was located. Oh, something else. They used to make uh, crowns in the shape of a fish head were worn by the chief priests of the Babylonian cult to honor the fish god. Um, you know, and, and they, uh, they, uh, this, this was then adopted by the Roman emperors who used the Latin title Pontifex Maximus, which means major keeper of the bridge. Same title was later used by the Bishop of Rome. The Pope today is often called the Pontiff, which comes from the word Pontifex. Okay. Oh, that's enough about Babylon. Okay. Now, in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 17, John now has another vision. And there came one of the seven angels that had the seven bowls and spake with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and they that dwell in the earth were made drunken with the wine of her fornication. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stone and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations, even the unclean things of her fornication. And upon her head, upon her forehead, a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So, this vision of John. The next thing he sees is a great harlot or a prostitute which is given the name of Babylon. And just like, you know, just like physical prostitution takes something that has a, a legitimate use, sex, and uses it in an illegitimate way, there's also a concept throughout the Old Testament known as spiritual fornication, where what do they do? 
they take a religion which has a proper use and then, then they prostitute it into an improper use. And the concept of spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication, a spiritual harlotry is something that is quite evident throughout the Old Testament prophets. Um, and some key passages are Hosea chapters 1 and 2, uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 and 3, Ezekiel uh, chapter 16 and Ezekiel 22. Um, all, of these, all of these chapters are dealing with fornication in its spiritual sense rather than in its physical sense. How do you, how do you fornicate spiritually? You turn away from God and you worship idols or you worship something else. That's fornication, a spiritual adultery. For us today, our, we are espoused to one, our bridegroom, Jesus. But if we go chasing after the world and after other things, that's spiritual adultery because we're, we're already betrothed to Christ. Okay. So now what we see here is that John sees what is the counterfeit bride of Christ. Except the true bride of Christ is a virgin. But this counterfeit bride is pictured as a prostitute. And we're told in verse 1 that she sits on many waters. And the many waters, we, we see in verse 15, we're told. And he said unto me, the waters which thou saw, this is verse 15, I'm going ahead. And the, he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the harlot sittest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the waters upon which this, 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 uh, this great harlot sits, this Babylon, uh, uh, is the population of the world. And what we're told by this is that she is the one ruling over the religious affairs of the world during the first half of the Great Tribulation. Because remember, John is simply going back to filling some gaps of, of what he spoke about earlier. And verse 2, we have fornication with kings of the earth. And what this is showing us is that there is a unity of, of church and state, and they're in bed together. They're in bed together with this great harlot, the world. Yeah. Also in verse 3, she has great political power. Because John... John next saw the woman sitting on the beast. She sits upon the beast with seven heads and ten horns. We discussed all that in relation to the times of the Gentiles uh, a couple of weeks ago. At this point, all we need to make out of this is that during the first half of the tribulation, she does have the support of civil government. So there's a total unity of church and state at this point. She does have the support of the government at this time. This is in the first half of the tribulation. Now, the beast is clearly seen to be the Antichrist. And we see this from verse, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 10. If we compare uh, chapter 13, the description in chapter 13 with, with verse 3, what we see in, in chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. So it's the same beast. It's the same person, with uh, same, same uh, thing, image we're talking about. Now, the, the startling feature of this, this beast with the seven heads and ten horns is, who's sitting on top of the beast? It's the great harlot. The great harlot is sitting on top of the beast. So this indicates that during the first half of the tribulation, this... Uh, this, this harlot, this great harlot, will have some power over the Antichrist. So this event must occur during the first part of the tribulation before the Antichrist overthrows religion and requires everyone to worship him. Remember, that doesn't happen until the midpoint of the tribulation where he, where he takes over. So in the first half of the tribulation, this ecclesiastical Babylon, this great harlot, is the one who is ruling the religious affairs of the world. Okay. What do we see? The harlot, she's adorned with splendor, signifying the glory and wealth with which she will entice people. She's very well, well, the church at this time will be very wealthy and influential. And she's finally, she's given finally the name in verse 5, mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and of the abominations of the earth. 
So in her, in this, uh, in this uh, the mother of the harlots, what we see in her is the final form of the false church, the final form of apostasy, uh, Catholicism and pseudo-religions. We see that back in Genesis chapter 6, verse Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. What we see in this woman, what we see in this great harlot, this ecclesiastical Babylon, is the final form of two things happening back in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Remember, we talked about the woman Jezebel, which we defined as the Roman Catholic Church back in chapters 2 and 3. And the writer John clearly said that Jezebel would be cast into the great tribulation. And we also know that the Laodicean church, which was an unsaved church, remember Jesus was outside knocking in the door, waiting for someone to open the door. Uh, so the Laodicean church, a totally unsaved church, is apostate Protestantism. And that too will end up in the great tribulation. So now, in the tribulation, you have a unity of apostate Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, along with all the other religious elements in the world. So you have all the other religions in the world united into this one world super religious system that reigns over the religious affairs of the world during the first half of the tribulation with reluctant support of the government with the reluctant support of the human government of that period. This is the counterfeit bride of Christ. The counterfeit. Remember, Satan is a master counterfeiter. And this is what he is doing. Now, back when we covered chapter 6, we talked about the fifth seal saints which were martyred or killed during the first half of the tribulation. In chapter 6, that raised two questions. The first question was, how were these fifth seal saints saved? And secondly, who killed them? We know how they were saved. We already found it out in Revelation chapter 7. They were saved because of the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. It's at this point now that we answer the second question, who was killing them? In Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, we read, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wandered with a great wonder. So now we know who is responsible for killing the fifth seal saints. It is this ecclesiastical Babylon, the one world religious system that is persecuting the saints and killing the saints of the first half of the tribulation period. And this makes it clear that the apostate religious system of the first half of the last seven years leading up to Christ's second coming will be completely devoid of any true Christians. No true Christian will partake or be part of this one world religious system. They'll be outside of that. That's why they're being killed. They'll be believers, but they won't be part of this ecclesiastical Babylon. In fact, they'll be being killed by it. In verse 7, the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou wander? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wander, they whose name hath not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast, how that he was and is not and shall come. Verse 9. Here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Verse 10. And they are seven kings. The five are fallen, the one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a little while. And the beast that was and is not is himself also an eighth and is of the seven. And he goeth into perdition. And the ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one mind and they give their power and authority unto the beast. 
These shall war against the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they also shall overcome that are with him, called and chosen and faithful. Right. John now gives us further explanations, not of the woman, but of the beast upon which the woman sits. And we dealt with that back in detail when we talked about the times of the Gentiles a couple of weeks, several weeks ago, especially with the final form uh, during the Great Tribulation, the final form of the, of the last empire, the last beast, if you like. The beast is identified first. He's the same one to refer back in chapter 11, verse 7, as coming from the abyss. He comes from the abyss. Remember, the abyss is where the, the dead go. They go to the abyss. Uh, but here it is said that he's about to come up indicating that the events of verse 1 to 7 of chapter 17 precede his seizure of power in the middle of the tribulation. So this is the resurrection of the Antichrist who received a death stroke back in chapter 13, verse 3. Verse 7. It's clear from verse 7 that the beast is the same as the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. Because in verse 7, we see here, you know, wherefore did you wonder? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads, ten horns. This is the same beast that Daniel 7 was talking about, seven heads, ten horns. The beast has ten horns, seven heads. What the ten horns represent was explained earlier. What the ten horns is, it's the fourth stage of the fourth empire, the ten kingdoms. Remember, uh, the, 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 the ten kingdoms come after we, we move from where we are today into a one world government system, and then that splits into ten kingdoms. So these are the ten horns. Now in verse 8, we have the death and resurrection of the beast, the Antichrist. Same as in verse 8, back in Revelation 13, 13, and I saw one of his heads as though it had been smitten unto death, and his death stroke was healed. And the whole earth wandered after the beast. Remember, he was killed in the conflict with the ten kings. Remember, uh, we see that from Daniel 11, verse 45. The Antichrist, in his rise to power, he fights against the ten world rulers and he kills three of them. But in the conflict, he himself is killed. So the death and the resurrection of the Antichrist is seen along with the subsequent worship of him. Because it says the beast that you saw was, means he was living, and is not, oh, he died, and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go into perdition. The abyss, remember, is a place in hell or Hades. And they that dwell on the earth shall wander. They whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast, how that he was and is not and shall come. They wonder at his death and resurrection. Here is the mind that hath wisdom. Verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Verse 10. And they are seven kings. Five are fallen. The one is. The other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a little while. Remember, seven heads are seven mountains on which seven kings sit, which are seven kings. These guys, remember, these are sequential. They follow one after the other. These represent the seven stages of the development of the, the uh, uh, of imperialistic, uh, imperialistic government. Five heads are fallen by John's day. He says five are fallen. Remember, they were the Tarquin kings, the counselors, the plebeians, the cons uh, republicans, and the triumvirates. They're the five who were fallen. One head is. So in John's day, one head is still there. In our day, that one head is still here. This is what we call imperialism. We, we, and this went from 27 BC, when the Roman uh, Empire took over. Uh, this, that was the start of imperialism. And it runs to the midpoint of the tribulation. One head has not yet come. Well, it's obvious that last head, the seventh head, is the Antichrist. He continues for a little while. He continues from the mid-tribulation to the end of the tribulation. So he only continues for three and a half years. Now, position of the Antichrist we see in verse 11 of chapter 17. So now, 
We've just spoken about his death and resurrection, and John now describes the position of the Antichrist in verse 11. And the beast that was and is not is himself also an eighth, and is of the seven, and he goes into perdition. So, the Antichrist position as being also an eighth, but he's of the seven. He's of the seven. Why? There are seven heads. So he's of the seven in that there are seven heads and the Antichrist is the seventh head. Sequential, remember? He's the last head to come. The heads are chronological and sequential. They come one after another, with the Antichrist being the last to appear in the final period of the history of the seven heads. He is the seventh head. But he's also an eighth. And the way he is an eighth is seen in his relationship to the ten horns. The ten horns represent the ten kingdoms that come out of the one world government system, the fourth stage of the fourth Gentile empire of imperialism. We are in the fourth Gentile, fourth Gentile emperor of imperialism today, but we're not in the fourth stage yet. We have two more stages to go. We have the one world government stage and then the 10 kingdom stage, the 10, 10 horns. So these 10 horns, these 10 kings are contemporary and they rule together over the entire world. But we saw from Daniel chapter 7 when the Antichrist begins to take control, he uproots three of the 10 or he kills three of the 10 leaving seven for the remainder of the tribulation period. So, the Antichrist is contemporary with these seven, making him an eighth. He's an eighth. He's an eighth contemporary king, ruling over the other seven kings who have submitted to his authority. Because after he kills three of the ten, the other seven says, it's all yours. You can rule. So yet... He's of the seven, for he's the seventh head of those chronological and sequential ruling governments. Uh, and so the term seven refers to the sequential heads, while the term eight refers to the horns, the ten horns, which are contemporary. Verse 12, and the ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, not in John's day, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. The ten horns or kingdoms come after the one world government system. Verse 13, these have one mind and they give their power and authority unto the beast. Why? Because he's just killed three of them. The rest of them hand over their authority to the Antichrist. These shall war against, these shall war against the lamb. The lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they also shall overcome that are with him called and chosen and faithful. The final form of the fourth empire, the Antichrist stage, the fourth beast, the Antichrist, is defeated by Christ the Lamb. This is the person of the Antichrist himself, not the government system. 15, verse 15, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the harlot sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Well, that's self-explanatory. That's, that's the world. And the ten horns which thou sawest and the beast, they, these shall hate the harlot. That's what tells us here that while she has the support of these, these, these things, that is a, it is a reluctant support. And shall make her desolate and naked. This is verse 15, 16. And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and shall burn her utterly with fire. Verse 17. For God did put in their hearts to do his mind and to come to one mind and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be accomplished. Verse 18, and the woman whom thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So, in the middle of the tribulation, as the Antichrist moves out to gain both political and religious control, he gains full-scale political control by killing three of these ten kings. Afterwards, we're told the other seven all come to one mind and submit themselves to the Antichrist. He takes over religious control of the world by killing the two witnesses. Remember the two witnesses back in the middle of the tribulation? 
who have been in opposition to him in Revelation back in Revelation chapter 11. And thus now he puts away opposition from the true faith. But he also now removes opposition from the false faith. The Antichrist himself will destroy ecclesiastical Babylon in the middle of the tribulation. And he's going to set up a second religious system of the tribulation. And that is the worship of himself as the one mighty God. And by setting up himself and later his image in the Holy of Holies in the Jewish temple of Jerusalem. So during the seven years of tribulation, we've been faced with two political systems, one in the first half and one in the second half. And two religious systems, one in the first half, one in the second half. The political system of the first half was that the whole world was ruled in 10 kingdoms by 10 kings. But after three are killed and the other seven submit, the Antichrist institutes a second political system where he becomes the one world ruler all by himself and the other kings are simply petty kings under his authority. So the religious system of the first half of the tribulation is this ecclesiastical Babylon, this one world super religious system. It is destroyed by the Antichrist himself, and then he initiates the second religious system, which is the worship of himself. So throughout the second half of the tribulation, the Antichrist has ruled as the one-man ruler, both politically and religiously. As to where this super-religious system is going to be headquartered, we're told in verse 18, it is going to be headquartered by the city of the same name, Babylon. And that is enough for tonight.